Hi there, this is James Valvis, and I'm going to be giving you a short story today because it's Story Sunday. Um, it's a special story to me. It's one of the first pieces of fiction I wrote that I actually thought was any good. <laughs> I'd written quite a few stories before this, but I consider them all juvenilia, none of them very good. Um, but this story seemed to hold up pretty well and I think it still holds up pretty well today I wrote it when I was 23 years old I was just out of the army and I was thinking back on my youth when I wrote it and it was subsequently published in Reed magazine many years later and it also appeared in a very hard to find chapbook of mine in fact the first chapbook of mine my first chapbook uh, was stories rather than poems it was a collection of five stories put out by mount alcum press in 2000 uh actually 1999 and so it uh the very end of 1999 and it's the title story of that collection called the winters in jersey in any case uh this story has been loved by many people admired by many people um and for a long time, I don't know if it still is, but for a long time, it was the favorite short story of my wife that I ever wrote. And so, I'm going to read it for you now. I really hope that you enjoy it. And here it is. The Winters in Jersey. The Winters in Jersey by James Favis. The winters in Jersey are clear and cold and barren. You look out your bedroom window to the street that's dark and windy. The wind blows the tree limbs and bounces the telephone wires, vibrates them like guitar strings, shaking the pigeons that are perched there, pushing one loose. The free pigeon flies into the night a couple of feet, then drifts back to the wire and grabs hold. As a game, you try to guess which pigeon will jump next. When that gets boring, you watch the swaying trees again. It's Friday night and your mother has escaped to bingo. Your sister watches television. She sits on the gray couch like a pearl in an oyster, eating Ritz crackers, wiggling her chubby toes on the ottoman. Your father lies brooding somewhere in the back of the apartment Every so often, his voice shatters the television hum like a space alien breaking in on the broadcast. Your father is angry he has to work. He's angry he lost his teeth. He's angry he married your mother who spends too much time and money playing bingo. You listen to the reports from Planet Father for two hours in your bedroom. Then you say goodnight to the pigeons and go to sleep before your mother comes home. Saturday morning, you wake to find the winters in Jersey have dropped sheets of snow on the dark roads and brown lawns. If you're quick, you can get out there before anyone else, and you'd better be quick. By mid-afternoon, the snow will be so dirty, it will look like milk that has turned. The icicles that are so tasty first thing become blackened by bus exhaust or kicked into the gutters by loud, bundled-up children. You want an icicle. All summer you wish for one, to lick an icicle, to feel blue ice on your tongue. You think of your father. Shit in one hand and wish in the other. Your father always says. He thinks it's profound. You run outside, your feet printing the snow and pull an icicle off the fender of your mother's van, then sneak it back to your bedroom like a secret treat. The icicle looks gnarled like an oversized finger, and it seems to get colder the more it melts. You are just about to lick it when you see some drops of oil in the ice. They look like several insects, frozen to death by the winters in Jersey. You carry the icicle to the bed bathroom, and drop it in the toilet. You won't get to lick this one. Shit in one hand and wish in the other. The next day comes, Sunday. Your mother and father and sister are sleeping and you have the house to yourself. You don't go to church. 
Instead, you sit by the radiator in your room and watch the pigeons. You're thankful for this quiet time. The winters in Jersey drive everyone you know insane. By tomorrow evening, you suspect your father will be drinking again. Then your mother will be looking out the window herself, but she won't be looking at the trees or the birds. She'll be waiting for your father, and your father won't come. The snow will have been plowed and shoveled into big piles that look like obscene and mutilated snowmen. The icicles will be brown knives studded with more oily black spots. Your mother will phone her mother, your grandmother, and tell her she can't go to bingo tonight and tell her why. In a couple of days, you will be on your grandmother's porch seeking refuge from your father who has been driven mad by the winters in Jersey. You know all this like some people know a storm is approaching because of a pain in their broken bones. But right now, you warm your hands on the radiator and look at the pigeons and enjoy the quiet. That evening, your father tells your mother he's had enough of the bingo nonsense. It's every goddamn night and all she does is lose. Your mother reminds him of a jackpot she hit a few months ago, but she's lost much more than she's won, and even she knows it. Winning is not why she goes anyway, not exactly. You know the reason she goes is because she can't stand to look at your father and his toothless scowl. She can't stand the way he hacks up phlegm every morning, spits it into recycled brown napkins, and how he bosses everyone around between coughing fits. The winters in Jersey drive your mother to the churches to paint large black numbers with neon blue bingo markers and talk about how many times she's waited. Your mother has always waited, but very rarely hit. She waited for B9 one time for 17 balls and they called every B but the one she needed. Your mother waits for bingo numbers, like some Christians wait for Jesus to return. On Monday morning, your father goes to work like always, and he's supposed to be home by six. At seven, your mother is waiting by the window. You stand next to her and pretend you're waiting for him too, but really you're looking at the murdered snow. The snow has been pushed around by bulldozer-like machines and now make dunes by the curb that look like massacred elephants. Cars swish by, lighted by the street lamp, their faces inside unimaginable. One car slides down the street sideways. Its headlights paint spots on the apartment walls like bingo markers dotting unneeded numbers. The winters in Jersey come through the cracks in the window panes. The cold mixes with the hot radiator air. There are simply leaks all over the house. From time to time, you can hear your father scream. It's costing him a fortune. It doesn't matter if he's home. He doesn't have to be home. You hear him anyway. Your mother waits most of the night, but your father doesn't arrive. She finally goes to bed, and half an hour later, you hear your father's car. Its headlights burn your bedroom walls, then die suddenly. B9, you say, but no one is around to share the joke. Your sister is in her bedroom. Your mother sleeps on the other side of the apartment. The icicle got flushed. The winters in Jersey sweep into the apartment with your stumbling father. They are carrying a bottle of cheap domestic vodka. They are holding each other up. Your father screams something and the winters in Jersey answer against your window. You hear the bottle hit the table and then your father smashes a coffee cup against the wall. The winters in Jersey shake the window panes in their frames. The radiator quits working and you don't know why. You think about St. Paul's Elementary School, your school. You think about recess and the kids throwing snowballs. You think about the time three bullies chased you and you slipped on a patch of ice that was hidden under the snow. You lay on the ground while they pelted you with one snowball after another, throwing one and then picking up another and throwing that. 
You sit up and look out the window again. You think about how each snowfall covers the last. Each failure hides an earlier failure until all you have left is ice covered by a dusting. You hear your mother and father arguing and the winters in Jersey beating the trees. You hear your mother say booze and your father say bitch. You look at the pigeons toughing it out on the telephone wires, heads tucked under their wings. The argument grows louder, fiercer, and the trees sway even to this strange music. You hear your parents screaming now as a new snow begins to fall on the old sludge. By Tuesday morning, the snow looks smooth again. You decide to skip school and nobody notices and you know nobody will. You go outside to find the biggest icicle around. You check the fences and underneath the cars. You walk by houses with windows that are shuttered like sleeping eyes. Every step is a chore. The snow has frozen on top, but your foot breaks through that first hard layer, slips through the softer snow, and at last finds purchase on the cake ice underneath. You walk in a circle and find your way back home. Across the street from your apartment, you see a pigeon, a gray one with a gold neck, lying in one of the dunes, frozen to death by the winters in Jersey. You pick up the pigeon by one of its leather feet and toss the bird by a tree. Then you bury it with clean snow. You go back to the apartment empty-handed and wishing in the other. That night, your mother goes to bingo and takes you with her. She waits on I-22, then she waits on O-71. But someone else always yells bingo and your mother moans and curses the good luck charm she's positioned all around her. She waits on the jackpot too. She waits for N-34. If she gets N-34, she will have the entire card and win the $500. She says a little prayer under her breath and the ball tumbler coughs up B-9 and somebody else yells bingo. The next night, she is again waiting by the window. She waits until late, and then she tells you and your sister to get dressed. You're going to your grandmother's. You put on your boots and warmest coat. You put on your hat and grab a book. You meet your mother and sister in the living room. Then you go outside. Your mother starts warming up the van. Black exhaust spits from the muffler like your father's bad cough like your mother's wrong numbers. You look across the street. The winters in Jersey have blown the snow off the pigeon and its body lies there like a statue of a toppled dictator. The new snow has been plowed and dirtied and trampled. You're shivering. You see an icicle on the bumper of the van and yank it off. The van's hot exhaust has melted the icicle a little and made it not so brown, just a bit yellow. You hold it out to you, to your sister, but she says, Ick, get it away from me. You look at the icicle and decide she's right. You drop it on the ground. You get into the van. Your mother gives one last look, as if she's still waiting, as if, as if she still might hear her number called as if she still can't believe she has shit in both hands. She checks the rearview mirror, then stares down the road. Your mother puts the van in gear, and the three of you drive away. The winds push you along. You make it to your grandmother's apartment and change into your pajamas. Your sister goes to sleep, but you stay awake. You get up, your bare feet tingling, on the cold wood floor, you look out the window. Your grandmother's apartment is seven stories up, so you can see over the other houses and into the night, blocked only by the thin green bars of the fire escape. 
The sky is very clear here, and the stars look almost like little kids draw them, circles of light surrounded by sharp petals. In St. Paul's Elementary, you learn that stars are balls of very hot gas, but they are too far away to do any good, and most of the warmth in the universe is useless, trapped forever between here and there. All you get are the smallest of lights to warm the winters in Jersey. On the fire escape, you see a large icicle, the largest one you have seen yet. You open the window and reach out a hand. With some effort, you break it off, then close the window and inspect your prize. The icicle looks clean. It feels very cold. You taste it, and it tastes like the city, the snow, the stars, all the things you know and all the things you wish for. And you say, Bingo. This was James Valvis reading his story, The Winters in Jersey. I hope you like this presentation of a short story. It's a little more difficult to read a story than it is a poem. I hope that you'll like, comment, subscribe, share this poem. These things are very important to me. Um, and, you know, if you value what I'm doing, please, by all means, try to support it in some way. And, as always, thank you for listening. And God bless you.